my father said, there are two kinds of people in the world, Jews and Nazis. I was definitely raised by someone who had an irrational, sweeping hatred for, I think, for Germans, really. I have a visceral reaction to hearing German spoken. It scares me. When I meet Germans, I'm always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, how do you really feel about Jews? second generation or third generation and I think most of us feel still very directly connected to this topic. German I say it in a hard way and when I say Jewish I say it in a very soft yes. and, and careful way. It still feels awkward to use this word Juden und Deutschland whereas in English I can say it. Sometimes I struggle with my identity I don't know uh, uh, shall I feel somehow guilty? Do I say the right things? Isn't it shameful to say that my grandfather, who died in the war, I never met him and he left three little children. Is he a victim? Is he a perpetrator? What is he? Is it even allowed for me to, to uh, ask these questions? I was home visiting my parents and I left a book behind about German victims. And my mother said, what is this book? You know, what's a German victim? My aunt lost one of her children in Auschwitz and she survived. And every single day, every single day that she lived, every single day, she would talk about it. Maybe at lunch, maybe at dinner, maybe in the morning. But she was never able to forget that through a fence she saw her child and lost it. It was not a day where she didn't think about it. This is in the back of my mind. So this will always stay, so I can't erase it. I have to say, my hatred for Germany, for Germans, was immense. They had tortured and murdered friends. Uh, they were throwing, they were, as it were, making it impossible for us to, to live, the restrictions being ever greater. Uh, I, I felt very remote to what I'm on, with, with, a, with a certain measure of hatred. other side, the grandparents had baptized their children in the Christian tradition. The maternal grandmother, who was not baptized, 
was the most Christian of all. On my father's side, my grandparents converted. I didn't know that I was, by Nazi definition, Jewish. There was the Nazis who made, made me Jewish again. And then I became kind of proud of it. The first time I went back was 1950. I came to Germany for my dissertation to do work. There was still obviously a great deal of rubble. The Germans were still much more thinking of themselves as victims. And what I noticed was the German capacity for self-pity. Um, a, a really a, an extraordinary degree of, uh, look how, how bad we have it. Uh, and a couple of even suggested, you, you were lucky, you got out of this. Ich bin am 14. Oktober 1939 geboren, also kurz nach Beginn des äh, Zweiten Weltkrieges. Es war alles überschattet durch Trauer, Not und Zukunftssorgen. In der Familie selbst waren die Opferzahlen in unserer Familie so groß, äh, dass auch nicht zu erwarten war, dass die übrig gebliebenen Witwen und wir Kinder imstande gewesen wären, uns diesem Teil der Vergangenheit in vollem Umfang zu stellen. Und insoweit brauchten auch unsere Familien Zeit, um mit der Vergangenheit umgehen zu können. My first memory is the fire of the city of Freiburg behind the mountains. That was in November 1944. I was just two years old. My father, who was a professor of constitutional law, lost his job because he was involved in the former Nazi regime. I am the fifth of five boys, and my uh, parents had to find a way to nourish these five boys uh, in a time of hunger. My father had only one arm, because he was in Stalingrad and had an arm lost. And it was never noticed. Because it was for me very normal that he had only one arm. Die Luft war deutlich erfüllter davon natürlich, weil, weil, wie soll man das sagen, weil diese ganze Kriegsgeneration natürlich aus dem Krieg kam mit diesem unfassbaren Trauma. Wie kriegte man das überhaupt im Kopf sortiert? Wie konnte mich das, wie, das, das war schon, das setzte einen schon unter Druck. Das war ein ganz merkwürdiger, düsterer äh, Schock. Also man da war im Grunde unter Schock. Germany needed to have a clear sense of its past in order to become uh, a, a nation both acceptable to other Europeans and itself ready uh, to become uh, Euro European-minded. On the official level, there was the Ben-Gurion-Adenauer Agreement. Some people on both sides, both in Israel and Germany, considered it blood money. Um, you, you, you try to pay off um, a huge, unpayable off moral debt. Uh, and there was a great deal of resistance in Israel, in Israel and a good deal of indifference in Germany. There were a lot of tensions about it after Israeli independence. Should we take money from Germany? Do we want it? But in fact, it was important for the Germans. They understood that it was, in some ways, their ticket back into Western civilization. They had to pay compensation. And one of the most important ways to do so was to help build the then fledgling state of Israel. I was born in Tel Aviv, 1947. My parents fled Germany in 1934 to Palestine. And in the mid-50s, it was a very bad economic conditions. In Israel, my father decided to immigrate to Germany, and my mother said, no, under no circumstances, I'll return to the Nazis. No way. 
My brothers and sisters were murdered by the German Nazis, no way. But economic situation of our family deteriorated. And so in 57, they immigrated to Germany. As a boy, it was really traumatic to go to Germany. It was 57, the teachers were brought up, educated in the Nazi time. It was anti-Semitic air in the school. It was a bad feeling that, oh, he's Jewish and the teacher that. Uh, told them, oh, you know, the Jews have to reckon very well because they have to cheat uh, the other people and so. It was not so open uh, anti-Semitic speaking from the teachers, but you can feel it. The German way of dealing with the history is that there have been different phases. After the immediate post-war, all the people were just finding a mode of talking about this past in not talking about this past, just mentioning something, you know, these bad times, uh, these cruel uh, circumstances, something like this, very abstract. I was brought up in a culture where people did not talk about the war and everything that was connected to the war. But my grandmother, she was a very, very religious woman. And what I remember, and it was a kind of a strange memory, I woke up in the middle of the night, I was staying with her, and she was sitting at the table talking, and she was talking to God, and she was kind of quarreling with God. And it was, about a punishment that she was evading. She said, the Christians killed the Jews and God is going to punish us, all of us. And first I did not know what Jews were, I had no idea. She explained to me that Jews are very pious people and were killed only because they were Jews. Ne, verrückterweise habe ich das in der Schule nie durchgenommen. Ich habe, also ich weiß, ich habe Geschichte, glaube ich, abgewählt irgendwann, als ich so unter Sekunda, Obersekunda war. Und ich glaube, an der Gesch in Geschichte war, landeten wir nur bei Karl der Große, glaube ich, 800. Oder? Also der, der Holocaust war nie, nie ein Thema bei uns in der Schule. Und mein Vater war tollerweise, war also politisch immer so, würde ich sagen, so linksliberal und redete sehr, also sehr selbstkritisch auch so über die eigene Einstellung, die eigene Zeit in der Hitlerjugend und, und dann eben auch über, über die, die Judenverfolgung. Und man konnte ihn immer fragen, das war ganz gut. Also mein Vater war im Gegensatz zu meiner Mutter, die sah die ganze Zeit unheimlich verklärt, die wollte damit nichts zu tun haben. Also die fand, sobald wir fragten, ja, habt ihr das nicht gesehen, habt ihr das nicht miterlebt mit der Judenverfolgung und dass man in den jüdischen Geschäften nicht einkaufen sollte, und so. die sagt, nee, das haben wir nicht gesehen, sie immer. Und mein Vater genau das Gegenteil, gesagt, natürlich haben wir das gesehen, natürlich haben wir das mitgekriegt. In the 1960s, there is much more acknowledgement about National Socialism and the Holocaust in the public sphere. Like with the role of the German Wehrmacht, and especially the suffering and the destruction of the European Jews. And this was caused by the trials that took place. Eichmann trial was one of the ways in which we discussed and entered into the knowledge of the Holocaust deeper than before. The trial 
Yes, where at the same time, the period when students became very aware um, of uh, the way in which their professors dealt uh, with um, the past. Die Aufarbeitung der Geschichte des Dritten Reiches, des Holocaust, der Vertreibung und Vernichtung der Minderheiten, der Zigeuner, der Homosexuellen, der religiösen Minderheiten, alles das begann eigentlich erst äh, in den späten 50er, Anfang 60er Jahre und fand dann einen Kulminationspunkt in der 68er Bewegung, die dieses Schweigen beendete. The 68 movement was for many a break with the generation of their parents after a period uh, of, of silence. They criticized their parents because the parents hadn't spoken to them about their own involvement in the crimes of the former times. You could see that there was the first time something like an accusation, collective accusation from the second generation towards the first generation, something like this. But this accusation was never meant as something uh, that was wishing to understand what had happened at that time. Yeah? Because uh, the, 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 um, the words that were used were like, how could you do that? Yeah? But it was not ask what they had done, because as soon as they would have had this answer, things would have become very complicated. Yeah? Because the generational problem, even at that stage, was of course that it's very hard to imagine your father, your mother, your uncle, your grandfather in a situation where these people commit crimes, all kinds of atrocities, kill people and whatever. We tended to treat our parents as people who were guilty because they were older than we were and they had lived through this time. And you know, looking back, I have to say, we were, sometimes we were extremely unfair. You would never had a more useful weapon for accusation or for intergenerational fighting than saying you have been a Nazi, you are a fascist. This was the meanest and uh, most effective thing you could do because, of course, people couldn't defend themselves against an accuser because somehow they knew they were, yeah? My father was a survivor of the concentration camps. His parents were killed during the war and the Red Cross set up displaced person camps in Germany. So he came to Berlin in 1945 at the age of 20. At home we wouldn't discuss the war because you didn't want to hurt the feelings of your parents, but it would come up on occasions, uh, on high holidays, when my father was with his brothers or his cousins who survived the war. We knew that they would be thinking about it constantly. And there was this question, uh, why, why, why are we actually here? Um, and there was no real answer to that. My father came from Poland to Berlin, 1946. All the time I ask myself what made my father stay here and not to leave, as uh, maybe 80% of the Jews who came through Germany. You had to be a, a very specific character. Uh, maybe there, you had to be able to deal with an ambivalence inside yourself because you decided to stay here even if you should know that you were not accepted maybe those first years after the Second World War, you were not accepted from your surrounding here in Germany, and you were not accepting from the Jewish uh, diaspora, or even in, in Palestine or Israel later, from the Jewish people. Beginning of the late 70s, I was a teenager, and uh, um, it, it was, of course, difficult. We were living among our perpetrators and survivors. It was very tense, I would say, in retrospect. But in normal circumstances, 
uh, at school or anywhere else with friends, I never ever felt threatened. The opposite was true, actually. Uh, you felt like um, uh, this, uh, this uh, dying species that needs to be protected. When we got a little bit older uh, as a girl, it was no discussion that we are going to marry a Jew. It was impossible to imagine that uh, for them, that their kids would marry or, or mess around with Germans, even if we consider that they once decided to live here. They said about the previous generation, they were sitting on packed suitcases. That's what they called the Jewish community. It was like a transitory uh, community. Some of my friends left to go to Israel, and, and I went to the States, so did my brothers. And for me to come back, I didn't think that was likely. I felt Jewish only, you didn't feel German. I mean, one, one, one of my unforgettable experiences was to come to the United States and uh, see a Seder in, uh, in the Catskills and all the older Jewish uh, immigrants start to uh, stand up and sing the American national anthem. Unf unthinkable in Germany, unthinkable. I didn't define myself as, as German at all. Nor do I today, actually. I was very early interested in German history, but my father was a part of the Hitler Youth. He was 15 years old when the war was over. And so he told me everything about um, German war heroes and about um, the, the kind of tanks and um, fight planes. When he was a kid, a teenager, he was very enthusiastic with this stuff. And in the late uh, 70s, when I was 13 or 14 years old, I watched uh, Holocaust, the TV uh, serial. I learned then actually everything about the Holocaust by watching this film. We did something that we never did before and after, namely sitting hours and hours at the TV, changing our schedule in order not to miss one single part. I cannot explain how it happened, but that series made clear for me and many, many other people that this was necessary uh, to, to look at and to discuss. I was so appalled when I saw it that I turned to my parents and said, what? Did this happen? Uh, is this a fiction? And they said, yes, this happened. And then I was so appalled that I thought, oh, can I ask them the question what my grandparents did? My father uh, didn't watch it. And um, I had uh, an own TV. I, from my first money, I, I, I bought a TV, uh, a TV and I, I watched it in my room, alone, for myself. From this point on, I had another attitude towards what my father was telling. It was the time in my life when I separated from my father's opinions, and it was clear that I have to fight against every extremism, every fascism, every Nazi ideology. Slowly in the 70s and especially 80s, you start to have a younger generation of Germans that argue what we want is to live in a society that is democratic and liberal and modern and gives room to diversity and that also can face its past. In other words, to achieve and to build that kind of democratic Germany, we first need to put the crimes of the past on the table and confront them head on. 
in total in Sachsenhausen held 200,000 prisoners. We don't know exactly how many people actually lost their lives here. The assumption is several 2,000. I have family that was radically pro-Nazi. My grandfather, not being forced, not being cornered, out of his own free will, opt to volunteer for the Waffen-SS. When I was 12, my parents, for the first time, they took me to a concentration camp memorial. And even though as a 12-year-old there are limits to what you understand and what you know, it was still very much a revealing moment to understand how much that part of German history in some way also is part of my history. I was a teenager in the second half of the 1980s. And that's exactly the period when dramatic changes occur in West German society, where you almost every few weeks have larger debates in the big newspapers in Germany. And I start to understand that exactly that process that I am in, and that is to define the German identity of mine, also a whole West German society tries to redefine its own identity relating to the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. from Weizsäcker's 40 years speech that Germans have to take the responsibility and be ashamed and we, Germany was uh, liberated, not destroyed, but liberated. It was a cornerstone, but in reality, the minds of the people are working sometimes slow of a society. A society is like a tanker. It, it doesn't change the direction every 10 minutes after a big speech. The Germans erect in every village, big city, monuments which reminds to the Nazi time and to the Holocaust. I think it's a precedence that a nation reminds itself with monuments to their shame and crimes. One of my favorite and most important memorial projects is the Topography of Terror, which is the memorial site focusing on the perpetrators where the SS and the Gestapo headquarters were. Places like this one here are not places of memory. They are places where you should learn something. How did it work? Who were the perpetrators? What did they do? The topography of terror was a notion of saying we need in a local context where I am living to ask the painful questions, what did my father do? What did the mayor of the town that I grew up in, what were his connection to Nazism? From my point of view, a very important point is this institution here. It's all done by the initiative of citizens. It has grown from, from grassroot work. To begin with, it was a metaphor. Dig where you stand. 
it then in the mid 80s it ended up becoming real you literally had citizens groups illegally making their way into the ground bringing spades and starting to look for the ruins of these SS and Gestapo headquarters that had been covered with soil and the whole place had been turned into a dump. There is an element of the return of the past, an unearthing of what, what has been hidden uh, underneath. So we're in this neighborhood that since the 1920s was an area where probably around 13, 14,000 Jews were living and 9,000 of them ended up being deported. This map that we're looking at gives us a good idea of memorial and all the green dots that you see on the map identify one of these 80 street signs. All of these plaques have two sides. On one side we saw the loaf of bread and here it reads, Jews only allowed to do grocery shopping in Berlin in the afternoons between 4 and 5 p.m. And then the date tells us this is a law from July 4th, 1940. Right? So this really kind of emphasizes the whole aspect of the incremental process, step by step, not this one moment of murder, not even this one uh, incident of deportation, but showing how this only was possible because the citizens here were willing either to be active or at least to look the other way when Jews step by step were pushed out of society. This is an initiative by the locals, non-Jewish Germans, teaching others what has happened in this neighborhood at the time, including, of course, the political perspective for today. I must admit, I didn't want this for a while. We were afraid that the German political elites that started to take over the project after it had been a grassroots initiative designed this as a place where you could bring your political visitors and put down a wreath and say, aren't we Germans wonderful chaps and wonderful people? And we don't want that. We want memorials that are authentic, memorials that have a link to the actual history, that continue to be productive, annoying thorns. I'm afraid that Germans like to put the finger and take a look at us, how we do it good, and maybe you should do it the same way. So I prefer the silent memorials that go by and just by accident hit you. There is an artist in Germany who makes the Stolpersteine. And in front of our house, there are two bronze plates and there is the name of the woman who lived in our house. It doesn't disturb me, it, ri it reminds me there was living this woman in my house and be a responsible human being and a good mother and that this will never happen again. An angry citizen like me who is standing in front of other memorials go like, okay, now I'm shattered and now I'm getting angry, but where to go with my anger. What can I do now with this range? Now I can do something. I grab my cleaning tissue and run downstairs and clean the stones and make them shiny again. So I started with two stones and I ended up with uh, 38 stones. There are no graves for these victims. So for the people are left behind, these are the only places that really had a connection also to, to the victims. 
I heard that two Jewish ladies come twice a year and cleaning their stones. I bought two roses and I cleaned the stones and um, I took a picture and um, so kind of introduced myself to them and sent them the pictures to Israel and I, and I received a mail which was so heartbreaking. Um, They said they, they never expected that somebody would ever do this for them. I think it is true that most Germans now understand their past and the horror that they visited upon the world. But it's a very hard thing. And to find ways around to explain it uh, is a natural human re response. Socialist East Germany saw itself as the good Germany. They felt they had dealt with the problems of Nazism, or fascism, as they would say. Most of the Nazis were driven away, ending up in West Germany, and the few Nazis that were in East Germany ended up in prisons. So East Germans felt, we have built this society that has kind of finished with the past. We can move on, and we are this model society which meant that East Germany never really felt in any way responsible for the past. And the memorials that eventually were put up in East Germany, like Sachsenhausen or Buchenwald, were not places of any kind of self-critical introspection, but places where the victory of socialism could be celebrated, with the ideology and the main policies of the East German state. I was born into the GDR. I'm uh, from a Jewish family. My parents were communists. GDR was not an uh, anti-Semitic state, but it did uh, anti-Semitic policy. They didn't really like religious people, so they pressed all the Jews to go out from the congregations in the 50s. They were very, very suspicious to all the Jews because they always thought they were uh, Zionist spies and things like that. I grew up in Dresden, in the East, and there were just 53 Jewish community members. And, and there was no rabbi for East Germany. I mean, like for the whole GDR, there was no rabbi. So you can just imagine what Jewish life was like. It was really... Uh, cooked yeah, on very low fire, and eventually it would have faded away. Suddenly, you had two different Germanies that had to find a way to integrate two extremely diverging narratives about the past. You had that whole grassroots culture of thinking in critical ways about the Nazi past that had developed in West Germany, and you had East Germans who felt, why don't we now talk about the crimes of communism instead? 
So that was a big friction, a big tension for many years when unification had to happen on the level of the cultures of memory in Germany. In the mid-1980s, Eastern Germany was constantly looking for confirmation of its status and its independence, and decided that one way to approach the United States would be if they would show that they also made amends with the Jewish community. So they started rebuilding the main synagogue in East Berlin that had been destroyed, and started opening the doors for Jewish refugees from the Soviet Union. After a year or two, the wall fell down, and Chancellor Kohl made the decision um, at the time that it was an opportunity for Germany, in fact, to resettle Jews throughout Germany, to rebuild Jewish life. years to realize there's building up a movement of Russian Jews coming to Berlin in a quantity I could feel. Suddenly they were there <laughs> and there was an extreme uh, difference between us. Um, I always, and I think still today, I could say I never choose to come to Germany. With my husband it's another thing. They decided by their own free will to come to Germany. Also, ich komme aus einem Land, wo staatlich verordneter Antisemitismus noch an der Tagesordnung war und deswegen ist es aus meiner Sicht in Deutschland ein Land, in dem man als Jude sehr gut leben kann, denn es ist auch der Unterschied vielleicht zwischen meiner Frau und mir. Wir haben sie sie lebt immer noch mit den Problemen und versucht das äh, zu verarbeiten auf ihre Art und Weise. Warum ist mein Vater? Warum ist er da geblieben? Wir hatten diese Probleme nicht. Wir haben ein viel natürliches Verhält, viel natürlicheres Verhältnis äh, zu Deutschland. My whole family came here in 1993 from the Soviet Union on the Jewish ticket, as I usually uh, call it. The fact that so many Jewish people from the Soviet Union came to Germany is a sign that there is a certain recognition of how Germany has dealt with the horrors of the past especially for the younger generation who came here, and most of them stay here because they feel comfortable in this country. And I think this is the sign of, uh, of trust. This is our... Hi. It's uh, people from the community, the Russian speakers. The woman in front is a Russian writer. She writes on Jewish topics, a lot of Russian books. And this guy was a German correspondent for Haaretz. Shalom. Shalom. Hello. 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 How many Israelis do you think are in Berlin? I talked to the embassy about it recently. They say more than 10,000. Yeah. More than 10,000? There's, there's got to be a well, lot Well, the embassy more. would never say how many Israelis really yeah. are. In Nobody <laughs> knows, I guess. <laughs> but the German embassy in Tel Aviv give out 6,000 German passports a year. 6,000. And they 6, estimate around more than 100,000 right now. 100,000? Israelis with German passports. Whoa. Yeah. At first, I think it was a little bit of an issue with the history, but now it's... From what I gather, it's a non-issue. It may sound strange that there are Jews in Berlin, there are Israelis in Berlin, but Berlin is angesagt. Berlin is hype. Berlin is happening. I came to Berlin around 15 years ago as an artist in residence. 
got uh, some projects uh, to do and got a studio. I immediately fell in love with the uh, place and it was clear to me that uh, if there's a place like Berlin, I should come and live there. It was not really an issue for me as an Israeli to come to Germany. With German people my age, it's not your fault that you're German, you're not responsible, you know, for the for the Holocaust. Uh, it's okay. Oh, oh. But to say that I never thought while looking at an elderly person in the bus stop, you know, what did he do, uh, you know, in like 1942, to say that it never crossed my mind would be a lie. Of course it did, but it's never been a major issue. My grandmother came from Poland in 1933 to Israel, while most of the family, they died, most of them in Auschwitz. I think that she had this kind of repulsion adoration thing with Germany, as, as, as many of them do, as many of them actually do. On one hand, it's the Nazis. On the other hand, it's the Germans with, 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 with everything that they do is perfect. You know, like uh, she, she could say like things, ah, you know, the Germans. The Nazis, you know, but at the same time, you know, uh, the Germans, die machen gute Sachen, you know, they make good things, you know, gleichzeitig, you know. It's Auschwitz and Mercedes. generational thing because the third generation in Israel, uh, many of them, they come to Berlin as the new holy land. And uh, it's, it's like the big thing. And this is quite odd. I'm, I mean that after only 50, 60, 70 well, years... Well, that it's a land of yes, opportunities. It, it has uh, changed uh, a lot because people are upset and they are disappointed by Israeli politics. Of and course, they don't with, see with very good that reasons. It, I mean, I can't speak for the Israelis, but uh, I guess it means Impressive. that uh, they, they see that Germany has changed and that uh, they can trust <clears throat> the democracy Yes, I think Germany. it's really only because Berlin has become trendy. That's the only reason. I don't, oh, think, I don't think there's so some, much thought behind no, it. No, I think you must have some feeling of comfort uh, and hmm. security and trust, right. to Berlin's come. Berlin is a great city. Yes, Berlin is a great city. It's a great city, city. of still, course, for comfort. But it's great. still, you must have some feeling of comfort to come here. <laughs> Come here one step at a time, bringing people, sharing with people, teaching people, and learning from people. And together, over time, a community has developed. And today, there is a thriving Jewish life in Berlin. 20 years ago, there were 30,000 Jews here. Today, there are 200,000 Jews. It's true, many people in America, I'm often in New York, tell me, who should care? Why should we care for the Jews in Germany? I say, look, if Jews should move to Germany or not, it's a completely irrelevant question. The fact is they are there. If they are there, we have to teach them the warmth and the love and the joy and the radiance and the happiness and the spirit of Judaism. That's what it's about. Chabad opened up in Berlin and Rabbi Yehuda Teichel set up a Hanukkah in front of the Brandenburg Gate, which was as large as the Brandenburg Gate itself. I couldn't believe it. This made all the difference to me. I said, oh, wow, Hanukkah in front of the Brandenburg Gate. I mean, I can see it in West Palm Beach. I can see it in Miami. I can see it in New York. I can't see it in Berlin, let alone a huge one like that. So uh, that's the Jewish life we have now in Berlin. The decision to come to Germany was not such a big issue for me. As a musician, really, you, you just go where the best place for you to study, and that's why I came to Germany.
this is these people who are known to be uh, Nazis and uh, their grandparents were all in the Second World War and they tried to kill you. This is this education you kind of get in Israel. So the first thing you do with a German is you think, oh, what did his grandparent do in the Second World War? That's his first thing you do. And then you meet them and they're actually nice. You say, well, okay, they're actually nice. Meeting my wife was, for both of us, very exotic. For her to know somebody out of Israel and for me to know somebody from Germany. I think this is an important aspect of our relationship. And of course, these themes came up. Will I come to the family and they'll say, oh, he's Jewish. Is there anti-Semitism? And the Germans are, of course, very, very afraid to say something that will hurt the Israelis and they're really trying to be very kind and, and nice. As an Israeli, if you say, where are you from? I say, Israeli. I would see this kind of like, oh, let's be very nice now because he's Israeli. And I mean, once I was stopped by a police car um, and I showed him my, I, I did nearly an accident. Actually, it was very, very dangerous. But he stopped me and said, did you see you, you nearly crashed into that truck? and your mirror hit, and then I gave him my Israeli license. I don't know if that was the reason. He cut me some slack, but it's always there, this kind of cycle of, we did it, it's our fault, forgive us, feel guilty. I mean, there's no day that doesn't go in the German press without articles somehow related to the Holocaust or the Second World War. So the subject is always there, which is actually also very similar to Israelis. So we're kind of connected in a very uh, strange way um, that we both have this all the time being fed to us. There are different levels of, of experiencing of things, you know. Yes. I say this because as, as a child, we were so much exposed to all those, you know, bulldozers pushing the, the, the corpses and everything, you know, from a very early age. And each Yom Shoah, you know, that's why in Israel you also have uh, this Shoah humor, which here, you know, to the ears of, of German people, it's like blasphemy. Now that's the difference if you see the, this perspective, uh, you, you see the corpses. Um, pushing by bulldozers. As a German, you can't find any humor in that. No, no, no. So, so as, that, well, that is the different perspective. Neither, that is the, no, 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 no. no I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, 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 it's the accumulation <laughs> of. It's the accumulation yeah. of these things when you expose it over and over yeah, and but, over. But the Germans over are again. also uh, accumulated with that. So it's the victim. It's the victim uh, uh, privilege oh, of course, of course. to to enjoy oh, humor. No, but I'm not putting. I'm not putting myself in. You don't debate that. You are completely all right. I don't want to debate that. The very Jewish kind kind of answering a question is to ask a question. Are you a proud German? Uh, Do you know many Germans are proud no, to be German? If it's, it's not sexy, it is not sexy to be German. Americans are proud to be American. Um, yes. Yeah. Really? I'm, 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 I'm honest. I, 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 I feel sometimes like a patriot. On, on democracy and on, on, on human rights. I think that is uh, the only thing you can create such a feeling any, anymore. And in, in this sense, I, 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 feel, I, I feel very connected to my country and to my culture. The German identity is, is tainted. Let's say, I am not a German, I am a European. Because that sounds uh, progressive, that sounds multicultural, uh, uh, open-minded. Uh, I'm German sounds... Uh, I'm militarist. I'm 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 narrow-minded. I'm I'm I'm. You know what I mean. I studied abroad. I lived in in England. I lived in Brussels. I lived in New York, and wherever I came, the biggest compliment you could possibly give to me was to say, "Oh, you're not German. You don't seem German to us." That's interesting. I never felt comfortable being German. Sometimes people say, oh, you could be Jewish too, because I have a very long nose, I have this curly hair. That was the biggest compliment you could possibly make, honestly. <laughs> I remember 
of course, the diary of Anne Frank. I could hardly stop to, to hold in my hands, literally. And I remember I was looking at it over and over and watching those pictures of their room on, on top of the house. It had a huge impact on me. I could not lose the feeling of deep guilt. My general sense is that there's still a very widespread awkwardness, anxiety, um, insecurity on behalf of non-Jewish Germans. Because as meaningful and positive and necessary Holocaust education was and is for German society, there have been many very problematic developments in that process, where people over-identify with the victims where they actually learn a lot about the Holocaust, but the only images they see are of Jews as victims. And any kind of relaxed, open, but also um, dis discussion-friendly interaction uh, with Jewish Germans or Jews who live in Germany uh, becomes very difficult. In my opinion, anything that is not considered 100% German and whatever that might be will not be accepted by the German population as German. For instance, I always considered myself German while I was in school. I wasn't different than the others. I had a different religion. But when I left school, when I left this protected society, I was never considered German. When people found out, and with my name that was fairly easy, um, that I was Jewish, they always said, oh, you're Jewish, and they never ever afterwards accepted me as German. I totally understand your point of you being insulted or offended by that. Mm -hmm. I just instinctively okay. would say, <laughs> said, sorry. Jews sorry. always interrupt. No, I didn't That's say that. That's what I have to uh, say. Uh, never let you go. They always interrupt. Let's have a toast on that. Jews are No, all I want to say is, it's just that Germans only know few Jews who live in Germany who have the identity you were describing as yours. It's not something they, they don't feel comfortable with, it's just that they, that they are not used to it for a very sad reason, because there are so few. We should not forget that the vast majority of non-Jewish Germans still happen to live most of their lives without ever encountering a Jew. And the Holocaust and Nazi crimes today is omnipresent in the German educational system. Most German students will two, three times encounter this. From all kinds of research we know that German students know much more than most Western European and American students about World War II and the Holocaust. I heard Helmut Schmidt say repeatedly, years later, um, that, um, that his grandchildren know more about the Holocaust than about anything else in German history. And I mind you, I, I have my own feeling, views on that. I think that's unfortunate. Um, okay, you, you must know about the Holocaust and so on. You must know about National Socialism. Uh, but that's not the entire history. It's not the only thing you should know. Schlussstrich is the German expression for the idea that we should stop the discussion about the Holocaust. Even very famous writers and intellectuals spoke out for that position. But I think people who address the issue in this way um, forget that we are responsible for a process in which the younger generations get not only a knowledge, but also a feeling for the consequences of our own past.
I'm not shocked to hear it again that there is in Germany hatred against the Jews. If you would ask, do you hate Jews or are you anti-Semitic? And of course they would say, uh, deny it. But uh, if you ask them, uh, do you think that the Jews have too much influence? Uh, of course. If you live outside Israel, it's nothing new. In my everyday life, I would not feel Jewish. But when you say, I come from Israel, immediately, it's immediately uh, 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 towards a German person, it's okay, I I'm a Jew from this moment on. And I know also that now the thought of my opponent, of my, uh, you know, as a Jew, is he for or against the Palestinians? And it is like that. It is like that. It's kind of a mistake of people to just think, oh, he's Jewish, he's responsible for Israel, even though he could be Jewish and never even been to Israel, or he's religious. It's like if you would take somebody Muslim and say, well, why do you kill so many people in Syria? I think we have today new new forms die des Antisemitismus über die wir reden müssen, ist nämlich, wie man an dem Thema Israel sich mittlerweile abarbeiten kann. Criticism of Israel will be used as a vehicle to actually turn the victims into the perpetrators and the perpetrators into the victims, right? to emphasize uh, things the other way around. And the classical one is, of course, uh, but now these Jews and Israelis do the same thing to the Palestinians as, as um, uh, we did uh, to the Jews. The political debate in Germany is difficult. If you criticize the Israeli government for what they did in the occupied territories, very fastly you are claimed to be anti-Semit. They say, um, why don't you criticize um, um, violation of human rights in Iran? Why don't you criticize uh, a violation of human um, uh, rights in, in, in Sudan? Why in Israel? The Gaza war of 2014 was used by groups in an unacceptable way for the expression of brutal and incredible uh, kinds of anti-Semitism. The difficulty, of course, is that we have to hold the space open for a critical discussion of uh, the situation in the State of Israel, as we are used to do it with regard to our own uh, government and our own country. Germany is a different country than it was 20 years ago. Many young Germans today come from backgrounds in the Arab world, in the Turkish world, where there is unfortunately widespread anti-Semitism. They're certainly not all anti-Semites, but they're coming out of this atmosphere where they're listening to television channels, they're going on internet, they're hearing a lot of negative things about Jews, and it's created a whole new problem in teaching German democratic values um, and in teaching the Holocaust to this generation. Of course there are challenges. Of course there are difficulties. Of course there's anti-Semitism. Of course there are problems. When I came to the kindergarten, 27th of February, 2007, when on the, on the toys there were swastikas painted, of course it was sad. But is that gonna take us off our track? No way. On the contrary, that shows how important it is to concentrate, to rebuild with a positive energy Jewish life. If in Europe uh, uh, any new like right-wing power will arise, it will not be from Germany. And there is, there are neo-Nazis neo here, there are NPD, you know, like, uh, yeah, they exist, you know, it's a democratic country and they are there. But Germany had its share. And uh, therefore, if you're asking me, as a, I'm, I'm saying as a Jew, but I have to stress that I am an atheist, okay. But as, as a Jew still living in Germany, I feel it's much, much safer than living in Israel. Much safer. In Germany, of course, we have antisemites. We have also German phenomenon of the philosemites. That are the people who love us so much and embrace us so strong that we have very difficulties uh, to 
take air to, to breath. Philo-Semitism, if I really want to push the point here, is almost as dangerous as anti-Semitism. If I have exaggerated positive notions about the Jews who are also fantastic musicians, the Jews who have this fantastic humor, this is not so dramatic, but this is part of the stereotyping, right? The Jews who are so smart, and then twisting a little bit, the Jews who are so well in handling money, right? And then we have, these are kind of pseudo positive statements about Jews. The one about the money is obvious that how easy that can be anti-Semitic, but every positive statement can turn into its exact opposite. preparation of the exhibition, we asked our colleagues what are the questions you receive when you um, tell that you work at the Jewish Museum Berlin. Rather than a risky exhibition, we considered it a necessary exhibition. I mean, a lot of German people have never met a Jewish person in their life. So how did you get the job? My mother actually saw an article in the New York Times about this exhibit, and she wrote me an email and said, you know, David, I think you should apply for this job. <laughs> It was not our idea to have a Jew in the box, but we wanted to have a Jewish guest who answers visitors' questions, who interacts with the visitor. It was very easy to get. I was actually, I was shocked. They didn't, they didn't, like, vet me at all. It was kind of like, you know, oh, you're Jewish? Yeah, go in the box, you know. I didn't, I didn't even have to prove I was Jewish. People don't come with concrete questions. They come with a sort of agenda, in a way. There is a certain generation, maybe, of German people who sort of, you know, almost want me to reassure them that everything is all right. They're not interested in how was it growing up as a Jew in Germany. Or they don't ask that at least, maybe they are interested. In Germany I often say it's like a therapy session. You listen to this patient and you think you know everything about it and then you, you find out there is another layer and another layer and another layer. And these layers never stop because in every issue, in every topic, you always find something where Germans are struggling with themselves and with their history and with their identity. And the same is true also for Jews living here. So we're both strugglers, fighters. It was a very strange feeling when I was offered a job in Germany. I debated a lot, should I come? And what may have helped me the most was the opportunity I had to interview Heinrich Boll, who was a very famous German novelist shortly before he died. I sensed such a deep commitment and engagement with the German people from someone who was more aware than anyone of the evils of the Nazi era. And I finally said, do you love Germany? And he looked at me and he said, it's not going to be easy for you here. Yes, I do love the German people, but it's a very complicated relationship. And I think it somehow helped me, give me the feeling that it's not an easy black and white situation. The question is actually, do you think that it is possible that there is again a, a, a new identity that you feel as well German as well, or do you, are you doing that already, so that we overcome this this Nazi distinction? It's absolutely not necessary for me to feel German. I'm citizen of this country of Germany. It's a democratic country. I love to live here. But it's for me absolutely not necessary to become a German. We became a multinational state. It depends on how old you are. Yeah. Yeah. And if I give you the answer, it, I give you exactly the answer. I would have never been able to wear the jersey of the German national team. And the Jewish kids today can identify with the German national football team. So to answer your question, it's a matter of time. This is, from my 
in Deutschland ein freies Land, in dem mein Sohn eben als Jude leben kann, sich nicht schämen braucht, keine Probleme hat. Und deswegen ist es für mich ein, durchaus ein, äh, ein Land, in dem man als Jude sehr gut leben kann. To call Germany a home for me personally was um, not possible at all until last year when my son went to Vienna to play there for Maccabi Deutschland. They came in and they were shouting Deutschland, Deutschland. And it was a very strange feeling to hear your son shouting Germany. I did not realize that still I was wearing all the prejudice, all the judgments of my father about Germans and about Germany. I must admit that I did recognize very late in what a wonderful country I'm living in. I feel that I'm living in a very democratic country today maybe in one of the most democratic countries in the world. Die Geschichte ist die Erinnerung der Völker. Und deswegen entscheidet sich das Schicksal der Völker jeweils daran, wie sie ihre Vergangenheit wahrnehmen und wie sie selbst über ihre Geschichte berichten. It's our history, it's our country where things happen that shouldn't have happened. So it's important to talk about it. Klar ist man irgendwie ein Deutscher und ist immer irgendwie so ein Teil von dieser Geschichte auch damit. Ich, ich denke mir, dass es darf auf jeden Fall nie vergessen werden, was da mal passiert ist. Und es darf vor allem, wir müssen aus unserer Geschichte lernen. Aber ich fühle mich nicht mehr schuldig. Es war auch wirklich eine andere Generation mit anderen Werten. I think the German society is more human today. For example, when I grew up in the 50s and 60s, it was all time be tough. Don't show emotions. Never show weakness. And today, you can dare to confess that you are weak. I think that's not weakness. It's a way of recovery. And that's a sign that the society becomes more tolerant. It's a huge achievement. I mean, there's absolutely no question about it. Germany produced for the first time in modern history, successful democratic institutions and extraordinary political leadership. I think the present burden is to make clear to the younger generation, listen, that achievement has to be defended. <laughs>